Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, hear from a state senator who recently decided to switch political parties. Also learn how new digital forms of communication are impacting public records laws. And we'll hear about family caregiving in Arizona. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A new report looking at the financial impact of last January's Super Bowl shows that Glendale likely lost money hosting the big game. The report offers four scenarios that range from Glendale making a profit of $13,000 to losing as much as $1.2 million. The financial impact of worldwide media exposure, though, was not factored into the report, which did note that hosting elite events comes with a variety of, quote, intangible benefits. State Senator Carlisle Begay of Ganado has decided to switch his D for an R. And here to tell us why he chose to leave the Democratic Party and join the GOP is State Senator Carlisle Begay. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me on. Uh, why did you switch parties? Well, when I was appointed and uh, when I was elected last year, I ran to really be a voice for uh, a district that has long been ignored and overlooked, and especially for a district that has different needs and different priorities than what I think in, than any part of the state. Uh, you have said that you were growing dissatisfied with the Democratic Party. Explain, please. Well, I think that, you know, for me, I campaigned and ran and have been in my district uh, really trying to change the dynamic of the way we look at representation and looking at, as I mentioned, the needs and priorities that exist. Uh, I ran on the basis that we will address issues and needs for their merit, not through the political ideologies of our parties and look at through the prism of what the need exists. And so uh, my first year uh, really tried to champion issues that I thought should be nonpartisan and uh, should be the issues that were, again, based on merit, and became increasingly frustrated that, you know, unfortunately I wasn't supported by, my belief, the caucus that uh, historically should have been fighting for the little guy and the, the communities that are underrepresented. I, you, you mentioned represent, representation a couple of times here. The last numbers that I've seen is that your district is only about 19 percent Republican, over 50 percent Democrat. Uh, the Democratic Party has come out and said, you're not really representing that district if you move and become a Republican or vote with Republicans. How do you respond to that? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, too many people pay attention to the uh, party ideology or the letter after your name. You know, I didn't run for this position for the title or the position because of my political affiliation in terms of uh, if I'm a Democrat, I'm supposed to vote this way, or if I'm a Republican, I'm supposed to vote this way. Uh, for me, the real issues in our communities are really what matter. We have the highest unemployment rates in the, in the state in my district. We have uh, some of the lowest graduation rates, the highest dropout rates, the highest suicide rates, and then you could go on and on. And these are issues that shouldn't be looked at through the lens of ideology. And yeah, people would criticize my decision, you know, he has no chances of being reelected. Well, you know, that's, that's fine. but. I'm trying to do what I can to move the issues in my district forward. Is the, it sounds as though, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you're saying in part is that you can get things done as a Republican. You can't get those things done as a Democrat. Are you sure the things you want to get done will be embraced by the Republican Party? Well, in the past two years, it's been the Republican Party. It's been the great leadership of the Republican Party, especially in the past year with uh, the leadership of Governor Ducey and uh, Senate President Biggs and the Speaker and other Republican leaders who have taken an interest and have said, really the future of the state of Arizona really is going to be dependent upon this true partnership with rural and tribal areas of the state and vice versa, that the us against you dialogue and perspective and mentality has got to change. And, you know, if I can work with these state leaders to see that progress in the future of these communities is going to be dependent upon a vision for a new future, 
uh, I've gotten that support from the Republican Party. Um, your uh, political career has been controversial from the get-go here, from the appointment. Um, people were saying that you hadn't lived up there on the reservation in seven and a half years, still live in Gilbert, and they're wondering why you're representing Ganado and, and, the, and the reservation. Um, how do you respond? I mean, I, again, we're talking about representation here. Um, you were a Republican in a heavily Democratic district. You don't, haven't lived up there full time in quite a while. Uh, Democrats are questioning that. Do they have a point? Well, I mean, uh, I was born and raised on the Navajo Nation. Um, I'm first and foremost a Navajo Diné in my mind. My roots and heritage will always define who I am and where I come from. And uh, I grew up in my entire life on the Navajo Nation. My ties were always to the Navajo Nation uh, and to, the, to Northern Arizona. Uh, even in school and in my career, uh, I spent before, in the, before I came to the legislature all tied to my district, all tied within my community. I've had a house here in Gilbert with my parents, but I've also maintained residence up in my district as well. And uh, now, now I'm married to uh, a wife from Ganado. And, and so, um, you know, the, the speculation, uh, of course, is, uh, you know, from many people's standpoint, based on the controversies of, I, I think in many ways, devaluing what what real reason I have to be down there. And again, again, from the, from the start of your political career, th there were some were saying, wait a second now, this guy is really a Republican. He's got a D next to his name, but he's really a Republican. And oftentimes you did vote with the Republican Party on the budget was the major headline maker there uh, for some infrastructure there on the reservation. Uh, but, but again, other folks that represent that district, they, they said that your vote for the budget and other votes was shameful, that you weren't representing your folks up there. And these are, again, these are representatives from the same area. How do you respond to that? Well, you bring up the, the budget vote as a good example. Um, I think there, there are many that would have criticized and, or did criticize that vote. But the reality is my vote would have never changed the eventual outcome of the cuts that were made. The, they would have gotten the votes with or without my vote. Uh, but what many people don't realize is there were a number of things that I got out of that budget that were tremendously impactful for my district. The $1.2 million for transportation for the Navajo Nation. Many criticized to be gay sold out for a mile of road. In reality, it took care of 1,600 miles of unpaved school bus routes the first year. We got new funding for our dual credit tribal college program to increase the likelihood of our native students graduating from high school to enter college and receiving college credit in high school. We also got funding for uh, other tribes like the San Carlos Apache tribe, the Tona Atam Nation for funding for their tribal colleges and the ability for them to negotiate that with the state. So those were all wins and uh, honestly all areas of the budget that were related to education and finally in my view, we have we had a opportunity to have a voice at the decision making table. Last question, very quickly. It sounds like I'm hearing pragmatism holds the day for you. Is that correct? Well, I mean, I think that for me, I was elected to serve my people. I was elected to serve my constituents, and unfortunately, you're in the day of the politics of today. You're expected to vote this way all the time, and that's unfortunate because why can't we look at this position and my position, I feel, based on the merit of the needs that exist in my district and providing a focus of what real needs exist in the state of Arizona. All right. Republican Senator Carlisle Begay, good to have you in the program. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org. Click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features to help you make a more informed viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or scroll down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. There's also a page for educators. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon.
Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an Aid Insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the Aid Insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. A report by the Arizona Capital Times looks at the complications in getting access to public records in an age when government officials use social media and cell phones to communicate government business. Here to talk about their story, Arizona Capital Times reporters Rachel Langang and Hank Stevenson. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Um, what did you set to find out? with this story? Uh, so as you know, in the past year, we've heard a lot about text messages and public records related to the Corporation Commission. Uh, so Hank and I thought, are legislators texting? Are our lawmakers doing public business uh, through new forms of technology, either text messages or social media? Um, and we wanted to know if they are, to what extent, and how easy is it for journalists or you know the public in general to access those records? I was going to say, if they are, I imagine everyone would have guessed yes. but how much business is being done? A fair amount, it would seem. Uh, that question's a little bit up in the air uh, due to the nature of the redactions that we got on the messages that we did receive. Um, I mean, pages and pages just blanked out with marker. Um, so you can't really tell what they're talking about. There are two real reasons that they could redact. One is that they're not talking about public business, and the other one is that they are talking about public business. And then a lot of the requests that we put in just simply weren't fulfilled. Either haven't been fulfilled, uh, it's been more than four months now since we put in the first request, or have been flat out denied due to the fact that they are uh, on a private cell phone. The state does not provide legislators with a state-issued phone. so. That's not the way the law works, though. Uh, you know, any lawyer you talk to will explain that to you. It's not the way it works with email, which is kind of the uh, the, the case law on this thing. Um, you know, if it's on if it's about public business and it's on your personal email, it is a public record. Uh, we're talking texts, we're talking emails, we're talking social media chat, third-party messages, all these sorts of things. It sounds like it's being done all the time down there. Well, and that in itself is not really that novel. We text all the time. Texting is really a, a part of our daily life now. Uh, it's just the, the point is that it's really hard to get to in terms of a record. Uh, so it's not that they're texting, it's just that they're not maintaining those text messages. Right. Uh, it's not that they're using social media, it's just that how do we know how they're using it? How so. about, uh, let's compare, governor's office, how did they respond? Legislature, how did the, how did uh, the leaders the, respond? The governor's office was uh, fairly quick in comparison. Uh, and really didn't use that much uh, texting in their office with them and legislators. Uh, the, the main bulk of records that we did get back was the Democrats in both caucuses, and they text a lot. But like Hank said, we don't really know yeah, about what. A lot uh, of it redacted. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Republicans, it sounds like the Republicans uh, in the Senate especially, uh, and Senate President Andy Biggs, he doesn't think that there's any information there for the public to see at all, does he? At, at least that's what his spokesman tells us. He won't talk about the issue. Uh, I've tried to bring it up to him in person. He says, you know, I'm not going to comment on that. But the basic uh, reason that the spokesman said is, you know, it's, it's his personal cell phone, which we, you know, had our attorney send them a letter saying, would you please explain that? There's a, a part of the public records law that says if you deny this, you have to give an explanation. Um, they didn't cite any law that says because it's my personal phone, it's not a public record. And in fact, the case law shows that that's, that's just not the way the, the law works. As far as uh, legislative privilege, how does that factor into all this? Well, it, some would say it's overused. Basically, it's, it's a, a way they can redact things and say we were talking about uh, we were deliberating about legislation. We were trying to figure out, get to the best product at the end of it. And legislators are allowed to do that. They're allowed to have uh, some of their deliber de deliberations uh, redacted. But in, in some folks' view that we've talked to, it happens too much in, in these records. So. And again, there's not, there shouldn't be any question. These messages are covered under public records laws. Correct? Yes, the, the State Office of Library, Archives, and Public Records uh, clearly says, you know, you have to retain your text messages. They're in charge of retaining public records because they are public records if they're about public business. There's really no question about it. And, and getting access to this kind of uh, the texting and the emails up, uh, significantly more difficult than other public records requests? Absolutely. I mean, public records requests uh, in my few years at the Capitol have become increasingly difficult to get fulfilled, get fulfilled in a meaningful manner. 
Uh, but this is on a whole nother level. You know, we, we routinely ask for emails from lawmakers, including emails sent or received from their personal email addresses. And we get very little pushback on that because that has been so frequently used, so much decided. But when you're talking about text messages or social media messages, uh, it's just a whole new frontier that Frankly, I think a lot of lawmakers just aren't receiving the proper training that this is a public record. Well, and with that in mind, will this be an issue that could possibly be addressed in the next session? Uh, we've heard that there will be some discussion of public records and whether that means lawmakers choose to further restrict public records or clarify what exactly a public record is, uh, that remains to be seen. I think it's something that we're a little nervous about. You know, anytime public records are discussed by the legislature, there's a potential for a negative outcome for public access. But I would imagine that discussion would be shaped greatly if and when a lawsuit happens to come flying down the pike. I think it would be shaped greatly if and when a lawsuit comes down the pipe. Um, you know, whether that happens or not, is, it's still something that we're not laying all our cards on the table right now. Um, we, we may or may not bring something like that, but I think that every citizen should be concerned about, you know, the way that our, our, public, our, our public officials are conducting business and keeping it secret from oh, the people. All right. Very good. Great job. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading looks at a recent AARP survey of family caregiving in Arizona. And here to talk about the results of the survey is AARP State Director Dana Kennedy. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Thank you. Good to have you here. Uh, a survey on family caregiving in Arizona. Explain, mm -hmm. please. Well, we wanted to survey caregivers in Arizona, Arizona residents, to find out what was on their minds, um, what type of tasks that they were performing every single day and what their day looked like and what their concerns were. Before we get too deeply into this, define a caregiver. Well, for the purpose of this survey, it's a family caregiver. So somebody who's caring for a spouse or a loved one, um, usually elderly. It's not a paid caregiver. So that would be a different show. Different, okay, but this is yeah. family caregivers. Mm -hmm. And what exactly, or in general, do caregivers do? I mean, they can um, fill medications. They can take a loved one to a medical appointment. They could do very intimate care as well, um, help with bathing, getting dressed, mm -hmm. all kinds of activities of daily living. Shopping chores, meals, finances, the whole nine yards, I Absolutely. would imagine. Absolutely. Everything that you think of um, that you do on a daily basis that you may not be able to do if you were de declining health. And it could also mean something as simple, I would imagine, as companionship. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what the majority of um, caregivers feel that they do is the companionship and socialization. All right. So who is the typical Arizona caregiver? Well, it's a woman and she's 61 years old and she is um, working usually and she could have kids, but that's your typical caregiver that we found in the survey. And those with kids, so you're talking uh, caregiving for the older adult, taking care of the little ones too. The sandwich generation. Yes. Yeah, that's what happened in my family. Talk to us about so, this. So um, my great grandfather lived to be 99 years old and um, my mom had another child 21 years old um, or 20, 21 years after I was born. So, oh my goodness. So we had five generations in my family living at once. So my grandfather would come and live with us for respite um, to get away from his, his, his daughter <laughs> and son-in-law. And um, he would just come live with us and eventually he lived with, a, lived with us full time. 
It, it sounds as though uh, that could be stressful. According to the caregiver's report, how many caregivers do report feeling stressed? Two-thirds. Two-thirds. Yeah, yeah. Two-thirds are feeling extremely stressed. And that's just, just in general, not just for money issues, but just the fact that you've got all these concerns coming every which way. That's absolutely correct, yeah. Um, as far as getting enough rest, as far as balancing work and family, again, what did the report find? I mean, I think one of the most telling statistics is 68% are having to modify their work schedule in order to care for a loved one. And that creates a different picture than caring for a sick child because we are, your older parent, it could go on for a really long time. So to have to modify your work schedule for two days is one thing, but it could be you know, ongoing issue. How many caregivers either have the ability to do this or uh, choose to go ahead and get professional care to get some help in one way, shape, or form? Well, I think the majority have tried to do it on their own. And when they're not able to, if, if finances are available, then mm -hmm. they bring in a paid caregiver. And as far as, the eco uh, that's bringing in the paid, but as far as the economic value of a family caregiver, I would imagine that would be relatively sizable. $9.4 billion oh my goodness. in Arizona alone. And, and, and how do you measure that kind of value? Just by taking what a professional would do and transferring it over? We say a paid caregiver would be about $12 an hour. Yeah. And they're providing about 800 hours of work. So we've got people watching right now saying, that's me. That, mm -hmm. That's what we're going through right now at our house. What kind of resources are out there? What kind of information is out there to help? Well, I think, first of all, we need to help people navigate the maze. They think that they're alone and they don't know where to turn to. Um, and sometimes they need a lot of care and sometimes they just need to know what's available. And they can go to our website, AARP forward slash caregiver to get started. Um, in Maricopa County, they can also go to the Area Agency on Aging, Region 1. And there's also a caregiver resource line, um, which provides um, some direction as far as where to go. As, as far as where uh, Arizona stands compared to other states, other regions, I would imagine with so many retired folks out here, it's, it, this is a big, bigger issue here maybe than other areas? Absolutely. And unfortunately with the budget, um, Adult Protective Services um, has received cuts after cut after cut. Last year the governor actually did, did increase the funding for Adult Protective Services. But I think that just like Child Protective Services, we're just waiting for that, for that to balloon, to bust. Um, because Adult Protective Services is really increasing on their caseloads, but the, but the funding isn't following. With a baby boom generation aging, I would imagine that has to, something's got to be done there. I mean, that, the needs there have to be increasing. Absolutely. It's increasing every single day. Um, and we need to do something. And funding is part of it, but also just being able to let caregivers know that there's help out there, there's support groups, um, there are respite services. We last weekend had a caregiver, a, care, a caregiver day for caring for mm. our caregivers. And we provided respite services if they needed it. And we had massages and Tai Chi and yoga. So there are things and programs available. People just don't know how to, re, how to access them. Just something to get you out of that particular loop and get some, some relaxation. Because again, two thirds experiencing stress, that's pretty significant. Yeah. yeah and a lot aren't exercising, they're not taking care of themselves. So then you're gonna see the effects of a caregiver not taking care right. of themselves. Right. Um, I have a friend right now, their family is dealing with that. Her father is sick and then her mother just had a chronic condition happen immediately. So now both of the parents are in the hospital and they're wondering how to navigate this. Right. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, AARP is behind something called the CARE Act. What is that? Yes. So we are, we're, we're trying to get work with hospitals to be able to make sure that they identify a caregiver when somebody is admitted to the hospital. And then prior to um, discharge, that they educate that caregiver on how to properly care for their loved ones. Um, medication management, sometimes it's changing a wound. Um, there's a lot of different things that happen when somebody returns home. And we are trying to make sure that hospitals are working with caregivers to be able to educate them. So there are, again, there are resources, there are avenues to take uh, to get more information, to help take a little bit of that stress off and to move forward. Yes, absolutely. And the website again to get some of those resources? AARP forward slash caregiver. AARP forward slash caregiver. All right, Dana, good to have you here. Thank, Thank you so you much so for much. joining us. Thank you.
And Thursday on Arizona Horizon, it's an Arizona education special. Find out about efforts to get students ready for college and career, and we'll learn about professional development for teachers. That's at 5.30 and 10 on the next Arizona Horizon. A reminder, if you'd like to watch tonight's program again or see any previous episodes of Arizona Horizon or check out what we have planned for the future, check us out at azpbs.org slash horizon. That's azpbs.org slash horizon. Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great Thanksgiving. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.